Um, I feel quite privileged to be asked to um, speak about the life of Mary Glowry, Sister Mary of the Sacred Heart. And like uh, many of you, I'm sure, I have been edified by our own Anna Crone's here series of articles on the life of this woman in recent times. In particular, I've been awakened by Anna's recognition of the feminine genius at play in the life of Mary Glowry. And in light of that awakening, I would like um, this morning to offer my own feeble reflection on the feminine genius of this great woman. Not just for you, dear sisters, um, as a source of inspiration and encouragement for your lives as Catholic women, but also in recognition that the genius of women is essential to the life of the church itself. It's intrinsic to the church's identity as the bride of Christ. And in this sense, we realise that the church is feminine and must learn what is essential to the feminine as a response to her bridegroom, Christ our Lord. All of us who are baptised, women and men, must therefore consider this feminine response to Christ, a response that Mary Glowry made with particular accomplishment. The fact that this idea of a feminine genius might seem novel to us may be reflective of the fact that we have been blinded to the true nature of the church as it relates to Christ. Sin blinds us to the nuptial bond between Christ and the church and therefore threatens the feminine image of the church. I think that Christopher West, an American theologian, puts it well when he says that because of Satan's deception, we have come to see God's masculine bridegroom initiative as that of a tyrant with a will to rule over us. Hence, we reject our posture of receptivity as feminine bride in favour of being our own masculine lords. We want to be like God, but without God. In this situation, we come to see the feminine, which symbolises our true humanity, as a weakness to be dominated and controlled, even snuffed out. Then he asks, does this not explain perhaps why there has been a tendency to favour masculinity over femininity throughout human history? We only have to look around and see the fruits of the secular feminist movement in which the feminine quality is oftentimes sacrificed when women take on the more masculine traits of our society. And because of this tendency and of of our forgetfulness, the tendency to reject the feminine throughout history, even in our own times, we need more more urgently than ever the prophetic genius of women, to remind us all of our true dignity as we stand before God. It was blessed John Paul II who crafted the term feminine genius. When we hear the word genius, certain images naturally come to mind. We think perhaps of a person of exceptional intelligence or talent, or of one who is especially endowed with creativity, or who succeeds in extraordinary accomplishments. And while such a definition is not contradictory to what is essentially feminine, it is not the essence of genius that John Paul envisaged. In his letter to women in 1995, John Paul set before us the figure of the Blessed Virgin as the archetype of feminine genius. He wrote, the church sees in Mary the highest expression of the feminine genius, and she she finds in her a source of constant inspiration. Mary called herself the handmaid of the Lord. Through obedience to the word of God, she accepted her lofty, yet not easy vocation as wife and mother in the family of Nazareth. Putting herself at God's service, she also put herself at the service of others, a service of love. In setting before us the example of Mary of Nazareth, we therefore come to realise that genius is not determined by doing great things of power or of influence. In the lowly handmaid of the Lord, the feminine genius is characterised by service, by receptivity and obedience to God's word. 
According to Cardinal Angelo Scola, the prophetic genius of women is particularly tied to the logic of love, which, in the end, is the only thing credible to man. In that same letter to women, Blessed John Paul acknowledged the genius of women expressed particularly in the social and the ethical dimensions, which deals with human relations and spiritual values. Therefore, this must be the criteria by which we judge the feminine genius of someone like Mary Glowry. Now, for anyone who knows anything about her life, there is, of course, evidence of genius in the conventional use of the term. She was a woman of extraordinary talent and achievement, a woman before her times in many ways. She was a pioneering woman in the field of medicine. She possessed a sharp intellect, was gifted with languages and had a remarkable memory. In this context, her sister Lucy comments that she could always read quickly, absorb it and remember what she had read. She kept up to date with medical progress, reading journals on the run between her many appointments and was something of a medical researcher in her own right. But her feminine genius went far deeper. If, as mentioned above, the prophetic genius of women lies in love, in human relations and spiritual values, then Mary Glowry was ritually endowed indeed. Human relations were at the core of her life, especially with her family. Her short autobiography is filled with tender stories from her youth. Even when, after she had gone to India, and despite the incredible busyness of her life, she always divided time, devoted time to communicate with family and friends back home. Reading through the many volumes of her letters, one is struck by the devotion to family, remembering birthdays, celebrating significant milestones, asking news and giving medical advice. In a letter to her lifelong friend Eileen Fitzgerald, she writes, We are told that in heaven we may have all the joys we wish. Somehow my heaven must contain such simple joys as these, joys inseparable from the remembrance of kind hearts and simple homely ways. Your long letter of some months ago was so full of interesting news about friends of bygone years. Do I remember them? Are there names in my prayers? There was a time when I feared that I spent too much time remembering. But time and distance cannot part true friends. I have them all immersed in that ocean of goodness, the sacred heart. Sometimes it happens that one or other claims my attention in a special way and I must needs pray much for him or her. I take it that it is a whisper from my guardian angel and I respond accordingly. We might reflect that at a time when religious life was cruelly caricatured as being distant and removed, Sister Mary of the Sacred Heart was intimately connected to her family and friends. This strong family bond may be understandable in the light of Mary's natural reticence and dependency. Her sister Lucy again writes that it, it seemed to us an understood thing amongst our parents and older members of the family that Mary needed our protection. She was so shy, quiet and humble that she could be imposed upon, hurt and wouldn't defend herself. Yet, she is careful to add, she was not weak or childish. In fact, she was full of ideas and alert, but shy in acting or expressing herself to others. In the same letter, Lucy also remarks on Mary's sensitivity, her thoughtfulness and her obedience to parents and superiors. It was Mary's father we, re father we read that first sowed in her mind the thought of studying medicine. She was studying arts at the University of Melbourne at the time, a day student at Ormond College. When she mentioned the possibility of transferring to medicine, the principal of that college was strongly averse to it. There was the problem of whether her scholarship would allow her to train, change track. However, more troubling to Mary was the concern that medicine would somehow make her unfeminine. 
Indeed, a doctor who tended the sisters of the convent where Mary boarded at this time remarked that medicine would deprive her of her womanly dignity. If she wants to be a doctor, he said, she must forget that she is a woman. <laughs> when, when, she heard this concern, well, when she shared this concern with her father, he strongly disagreed. On the contrary, writes Mary, he thought that my retiring disposition and my reticent manner fitted me admirably for such a profession. With characteristic humility, Mary adds that this was the first time I had heard any praise of these traits of my character. It was, we might say, an awakening to the feminine genius. The realisation that her contribution need not be in competition with men, nor conformed to masculine traits, but should instead flow from her instinctive feminine character. This insight was confirmed by a certain Dr Moritz, who Mary's father had engaged to encourage his daughter. If a young girl is not unwomanly to begin with, said the good doctor, she need never become so through the study of medicine. And indeed, far from losing her feminine qualities, she would bring something fresh and new to the practice of medicine. This was indeed evident even before that decisive move to India. Her sister Lucy again recounts, I used to go with her at night when in Melbourne, sometimes to take blankets and clothing to some woman or babe in dire need in Fitzroy, Collingwood, Richmond or in suburbs nearby. I would replenish her supply of underclothing and blankets time and again, for she always found someone more needful than herself. And the amount of free medical attention she gave was great. Her work as a doctor in India reveals a similar sensitivity. Father Peter, who was spiritual director at St Joseph's Convent in Gunta for 11 years, gives testimony to this effect, that only very few can combine an interior tenderness, tenderness of love and exterior devotion in the discharge of their duties. But this is in fact what Mary did. Father Peter therefore adds that, as regards my personal opinion, without fear of contradiction, I can say that Sister Mary led an inspired and angelic life. From one who was, as spiritual director, um, intimately um, connected to her soul, this is maybe a sure witness of her personal holiness. But more immediately, in terms of what she brought to medicine, it is another testament of her feminine, that her feminine qualities were not a hindrance, but rather a new grace to the practice of this great art. Mary's holiness, touched on by Father Peter, was undoubtedly formed by her devotion to the Blessed Virgin. Of course, a Holy Father, Pope, um, Pope John Paul VI, as an example for feminine genius. She was baptised after her namesake seemingly by chance, Yet it would seem that in God's providence nothing is left to chance or coincidence. In recalling the story of her baptism, Mary notes that it was her godmother, Mrs Neal, who took her to the church. But before going, she asked Mrs Glary what the child was to be called. Mary writes that Mother replied that she had not quite made up her mind as to whether I should be called Eliza, which was the name of my father's mother and of her own mother, or whether I should be called Alicia after her sister. Mrs. Meal made, made no comments, but when she returned from the church, she put me in my mother's arms and said, her name is Mary. <laughs> this, said Mary, is a privilege for which I could never sufficiently thank her nor our blessed mother. Family prayer also was centred around Marian devotion around the rosary with the now well-known trimmings that her mother would add in prayer for priests and doctors. She loved to attend the May devotions of Our Lady in the little church of Watcham and would regret when the month would draw to a close. However, her mother would reassure her with the thought that the month of June is coming and June is the month of the Sacred Heart. We might see here something prophetic, that it was those two names that Mary herself took when she rented religious life. 